The frame of Furnace Light uh, is a sonnet sequence about the decline and fall of my father, Brian Harper, who was raised in Timahoe near Stradbally in County Leash and later moved to Black Rock in Dublin. After his schooling at Petora in Enniskillen, he emigrated to London just in time for the Second World War. He was a complex man, full of contradictions, and had a fractured relationship with my family, especially after he and my mother divorced. In the late 1980s, he sadly contracted motor neurone disease, and this sequence is about how the illness transformed him and my relationship with him, but mostly in a positive way. There's an epigraph to the sequence, which is from the Aeneid by Virgil, which goes, each of us finds the world of death fitted to himself. Coming home. We thought the start seemed quite innocuous. A phone call, just a routine operation, a grumbling gallbladder, nothing to shock us. But for him, this was the start of a voyage into a pre-war life, a transformation begun by scalpel, needles, drips, and drugs. In time, bound to his bed, he became softer, more serene, as the bluster leaked with each gasp extracted by the ventilator. And as Odysseus' hound divined the beggar, we saw him suddenly step out from the past and welcomed home this long returning stranger, the father who planted trees for football posts, the wandering husband who'd left behind a ghost. My father's flat. Tugging apart the curtains every day, he always saw three stories up, a grand sweep of the Thames, the trees of Battersea, and, squatting there, the Japanese pagoda, in flaming, a parody of a bandstand, its four sides flaunting a golden Buddha. It glowed like a lantern near the glitzy braid of Albert Bridge at night. If he had crossed the river, he might have heard, renounce the world, escape the gilded lips, or seen Gautama lying in mortal sleep, his face relaxed, his flesh released. Even in death, teaching the art of dying. At night, across the river, Two golden eyes burn into the heavy velvet of the curtain. Two big games. My first soccer match was like a waking dream. Floodlights as pure as moons arc lit the grass, the white lines and royal colors of the teams. Tobacco smoke cloaked the roars and sucked in hush like sea mist. My father in the aftermath cursed the crowd, bracing to save me from the crush. Years later, at our first big rugby match, I was lost in impassioned ecstasy until the final whistle when I watched his jittery legs heave up his wheezing frame. I followed close as he picked his way down the stairs and pretended not to shield him from the thickening wedge of bodies and to hide the stone-faced feelings jostling me inside. Rugby Union Magic inside a sunlit television, we sit apart my father flushed and shrunken, gulping air, both entranced by rugby union, the cancelling man-for-man polarities, the chaos turning to organic patterns, 
bodies converging on the ball like bees, braced deadlocks of the scrum, the popped release of tension, the ball flung along a line as ordered as a wheeling skein of geese. Gradually, the years of absence tick away, and in the silence we are locked as one, gripped by the infectious currents of the play. His body flows with my adrenaline, my lungs are shortened by his fevered breathing. Visiting. It could be the departure lounge at Athens. Soundproof glass, anxious Arabs, Greeks, swept marble. Only the deep lifts hint at any menace. Within the silent maze of corridors, my mind winds up as I close in on my, in on my goal, dry-mouthed like Theseus sensing the Minotaur. Room 303. There he is, half man, half bed, bellowing with laughter, his blubbery belly quivering above the sheets, his twitchy head ablaze with pre-op nerves and quick-fire jokes, a bull tycoon as helpless as a puppy, eager for pats and reassuring strokes. At length I leave my unraveled mind is led from trail to trail, but cannot keep the thread. Intensive care. A realm of coming back and passing over. It lies below the ground behind sealed doors. I give the password, cross the threshold, enter, and see moving tableaus from a scene in hell robed psychopomps and flickering monitors, masked neophytes equipped with charts and needles, a line of slabs adorned with naked creatures collapsed like boneless chickens and restrained by wires, their stomachs laddered black in stitches. I sit beside my specimen who lies with punctured throat and softly sagging head, and hope that when at last he lifts his eyes, he sees the bleared face of his youngest son, not the impatient, bristling brows of Charon. The Return Anesthetized, he purrs, with measured doses of ventilated air, an artificial spirit which gently animates his vacant carcass, until he suddenly comes round, blinks madly, feels tubing at his throat and in panic mimes for paper, pen, and scrawls, where am I? You who were floating in the depths of space, weightless, revolving slowly, who saw the stars drifting into distant, ribboned galaxies, yet prickling your skin like phosphorescent atoms, and heard the spinning music of the spheres, crisscrossing like whales, eerie ocean hymns. You have landed safely on the planet Earth. Behold your shrunken bed, your universe. Last visit. A Friday evening in the year of drought, the open window flicked with flying insects. The room was soft with balmy air and light. My ailing father, plumped in bed, seemed carefree, as if a long-term deadline had been met. Relaxed, we chatted, idly watched TV. If I had known it was to be our last time, at what moment could I have departed, ever adding seconds of his life to mine? 
As it was, I picked a random pause to go, as usual kiss the scar on his bald head, and with a see you soon, stepped out into the lamplight of the slow embalming summer, which seemed as if it would last forever. Coma. My father sits up slumped inside a coma, his face nodding slowly on his neck, fed by the soft pushings of the ventilator. Instructed that he may not last the night, I lie down keeping vigil by his bed, alarmed in the gangrenous demi-light by his hobgoblin mask, his loosened mouth agape, disgorging darkness like a gargoyle. And still his head rocks slowly back and forth. All is quiet except the hushing breath of the ventilator. Tense, cramped, I recoil from sleep in case it somehow brings on death, until I gently drift away like James in the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane. Death. His plump, familiar body sits in bed. We watch his slackened face, unwaking eyes, and black, fanged mouth, its lower jaw unhinged. His head nods gently with the ventilator. A doctor comes to probe his dying pulse and coolly notes his fingertips are bluer. Brain dead, he may have passed away already, while we attend a grisly simulacrum, a clockwork, clockwork puppet, a ghost train effigy. And so it goes on, till a specialist, discreet, soft-spoken, leads us from the room. We wait and know the cycle is accomplished. I slip in again to view his body and see a stranger. Death looks up at me. Corn Circle It was the third day after he was dead, his body yet to be consigned to fire. We were marooned in limbo, as becalmed as the endless days of summer rolling by, turning to ash the surface soils of Wiltshire and shrinking the chalk streams of our valley. That evening we stood on Pepperbox Hill, gazing at fields embalmed in golden heat. And there, as if cut from the corn, a circle. We walked down and picked our way through rows towards the solar disk burning in the wheat and crossed the threshold of the Temenos, entering the benediction of the stasis, the heart of the sun, whirling, motionless. Cremation. The hearse shocks through the shoals of Putney, homing towards the bloodless drive-in chapel, bearing our father on his final journey. A scattering of family, friends, we try to sing to life this nuclear funeral, the unknown vicar speaks. We kneel to pray and watch the climax of the rite of passage, the coffin sliding into the furnace with the panache of airport reclaim baggage. Outside, as yet more mourners wait, we return to sanguine cells, taking home the ashes of all he was, within a plastic urn, numbing out the absence, the ritual vacuum, the last reductio ad absurdum. 
naming of parts. The lungs that sucked the foaming Irish sea. The tongue that sprung its traps of wit and puns. The nails that plucked the twinkling ukulele. The feet that trod the mud towards the Po. The hands that fed the water-cooled machine guns. The ears that heard the silence at casino. The freckled scalp that gashed a stalactite. The arm that kept a tennis rally going. The eyes that saw the comet burn the night. Have duly carried out their mortal service. And free from tyranny of endless doing, have come to rest in blissfulness of peace, as dead appendages of coffined flesh. The gorgeous flames will turn to fiery ash. Memorial Service Although the image is dim, my mind recalls a sharpened turquoise morning in September, the sun burning Blackfriars and St. Paul's, and people ghosting into church, the cast of his life, each a living tessera, a tiny embered memory of his past. And unforgettable, Foray's requiem, abide with me, swing low, sweet chariot, the burnished echoes of Jerusalem. Afterwards, friends and cronies from his club flowed out through the frame of furnace light, and brother soldiers slipped off to the pub to blink at gunflash memories of the Po, to blank out who would be the next to go. Last rites. A Coast Guard pilot in his spotter plane took off towards the tight-lipped sky above, bearing the urn of carbon flesh and bone. Clouds softened, and with a gradual smile the sun caressed the humming craft into a dove, winging its shadow to the flecked horizon. Unseen, the dusty atoms drifted down, acquiesced on the surface of the sea, completing the final dissolution. Now beady, darting fish invade his grave. His tombstone is every ship that passes by. Nothing remains but litanies of wave on wave, rushing over gravelly shores where they release their hushed prayers. Rest in peace, in peace, in peace.